If you're ready to take your destiny into your own hands, you've come to the right place. This is The Bulletproof Entrepreneur, featuring interviews with the most exciting and amazing entrepreneur. Here's your host, Chi Odogu. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to the show today. If you love what you hear on today's episode of the podcast, go to iTunes and leave a review and a comment. It helps other great listeners like yourself find the show. And of course, you can always find more episodes of the Bulletproof Entrepreneur Podcast at www.odogwu.com. And without further ado, on with the show. Hey everyone, welcome to the show. Today's guest is Terry Ergbun. Terry is a renowned owner and lead business consultant of the Ogburn Business Solutions. His proprietary coaching system and personal devotion to the development of others has contributed to the success of hundreds of small to large business ventures. He started his career out in 1979 where he invested his last $118.42 to start an air conditioning service business. At the time, he didn't have a car, a truck, or any experience in the industry. And he didn't even have business relationships to grow his business. Ten years later, he was able to successfully develop the business. And now he transitioned over into becoming a corporate executive for one of the large travel agencies at the time, which was UniGlobe Active Travel. From there, he realized after working for a couple of years that his real passion lay in helping independent entrepreneurs and small business owners plan, launch and develop their business. So I'm pleased to have Terry on the show today to share some insights about how to build, scale, and grow a successful business. Terry, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you, Chi, for having me too. It's, it's, it's an honor to be here on your show. Thank you. Right. So Terry, tell us a little bit about your background. I alluded to when you initially started out with that $118.42. I can't, I can't believe you actually remember the dollar to the amount to right to the last cent. But tell us a little bit about how you got started in business. Well, Chi, as, as you know, when you something attaches to you emotionally, you will typically remember it. Yeah. Um, uh, and that was a pretty scary moment for me. I had paid up my uh, rent, uh, paid up my uh, my bills. I was, you know, one month ahead, uh, so to speak. And that's what I had left. I had been... Um, fired out of the car business. Uh, I was a successful car salesman working for a, a, a Chevrolet dealership in the Tampa Bay area, and um, I got fired. Um, the, it was a way of teaching me a lesson that I was in. I was in no position to be looking for another job, so to speak. And that's what had happened. I went out looking for a, a, a sales manager position at another dealership, and my boss found out about it, and so. Um, it was his decision to let me go. So um, I knew how to uh, work on ducks. I was living in a, an apartment complex that it was that just started turning into condos. They were selling them off as condos. And in the furnace room was a broken uh, furnace duct where um, the duct was actually wide open. And I could tape and staple and tape that duct together and for 15 bucks. And there were 264 condos and I just figured that that would be about four thousand dollars and that would give me a, a time to get regrouped and get into something and so and of course if you were the buyer or the purchaser of the condo I could just walk in walk in and open the first door and say open there and say see I can fix that for 15 bucks and mm. of course it was easy sale and it didn't cost you know that was nothing to it and so um, uh, one of the people that bought a condo was uh, Jim uh, Foxworthy, uh, that's the uh, the dad of Jeff Foxworthy, the comedian. He was the regional president for IBM, and he was been transferred. So he was my first mentor. Okay. So now he moved in a few, I would say, a few months after I started this little thing. So he just started. We started hanging around and started coach, you know, mentoring and coaching me and th- telling me what to do. So I gained a lot of knowledge about business uh, from him uh, from the onset. So it wasn't long before I got enough money to get a, a truck and then it was, you know, then you start some advertising and so forth. And then it started to go from there. But basically all I had done really is created a job for myself. Mm. And so I hadn't learned anything about business yet. I was just, you know, doing technical stuff, you know, fix this, fix that. And then it's kind of like that baptism by fire. You get in there and you learn about 
uh, performance and budgets and expenses and P and L's and all the things that go along with business. So uh, that's how it all how it all got started, and it was something that um, evidently I was uh, uh, my passion or it's my purpose in life or it became my joy in life uh, to. Uh, not only build a business, I learned all of that that I needed to, and then I went in 1985 and started helping uh, small businesses and teaching them not to make the same mistakes that I made. Most businesses, when they start, they 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 don't want to pay the 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 guy who's getting all the money, the guy they work for. They can do the work; he's making all the money. So they launch their uh, so-called business, and really they're just creating a job. So I've Went around trying to um, share my uh, uh, systems and processes and how I evolved, and and it seemed to work, and that's how it all got started. Well, now you shared a lot of interesting things there, but I want to touch on something that seemed very important, which is creating a job for yourself versus creating a business. So what is the distinction between the two? Because a lot of people believe that. Once they step out and they hang their own shingle and they say, oh, I'm an entrepreneur or I'm a startup person, they they believe they've actually created a business, but they don't realize that they actually just created a job for themselves. So what's the distinction between the two? Well, typically when you're the, the technician in a job, the, the way I describe it is you start out with a vision like I did. I had a vision of selling 264. Um, then that vision turns into the managing a, of it. And then the next thing you know, you're actually doing the work. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's when you slip into that technical mode. And, but when you're, when you're building your business from the bottom up, um, you have less than a 20% success rate. However, when you learn to build your business from the top down, you have a better than a 90% success rate. Um, so that when you're building your business from the top down concept is that you're looking at all aspects. So there's bookkeeping, there's financial reporting, there's marketing, there's um, there's sales. So there's a whole gamut of jobs that have to be you know, accounts receivable, accounts payable. Uh -huh. and you got to have ledgers and you can have track of that because um, I worked with a company not too long ago um, that – uh, didn't do any type of chargebacks. So people come on the job and they'd want them to change this and that. So there was no change orders. I picked up teaching this guy about change orders. Um, this guy picked up like $10,000 in one month over change just because people would change stuff in the, in the construction industry, uh -huh. you know, in their job. Yeah. Well, if you don't understand, if you don't understand change orders and you know, you think, oh, it's no big deal. I just, oh, well, I'd rather have a blue sink. Okay, great. So you turn around and put a blue sink in. Well, that blue sink costs twenty-five dollars extra. Well, when that's working on the bottom line, it just came out of your profit of that job. And if you don't charge for it, that's just more money you lost. And then a lot of people they know how to take advantage of that too. So you know, the customer they know how to to do that too. So yeah, you have to learn how to put checkpoints and job descriptions and all these type of things into play that help you uh, under which all of this helps you understand business like P&Ls for an example those are profit and loss statements and most of your listeners are going to understand what a P&L is uh -huh. uh, the unfortunate part is a P&L is gives you how much money you made before taxes um, in business um, you want to you want your profit to be measured after taxes. Uh, co corporations and companies that are out there work with the philosophy of you want to keep 10% of what you your revenue after taxes. Uh -huh. So now one of the aspects of that people don't think about like uh, you know let's say that you take uh, a lot of people do PayPal or you know take credit cards or whatever. Well, there's a charge for taking those. That's correct, right? Yeah. Well, you, you should pass that charge on to the customer. You shouldn't pay that. Mm. That's that's a convenience. And that 3%, well, I would add 3% to my uh, tickets, you know. Yeah. straight. I had a straight price line, but I would just add 3% to the revenue to cover those costs. Okay. You got 26, 28, 30% tax bracket, whatever tax bracket you're in. You have to calculate that in and add that into the revenue as well. I wasn't the cheapest air conditioning uh, priced air conditioning company. In fact, I was considered to be one of the most expensive. And you do you you 
you can charge that kind of money because based on the value that you add. Oh. So you pick that up. Um, so that's kind of um, the difference between being a business person versus a technician. Yeah, um, I, and I understand what you're saying, but I what I think what a lot of business people are afraid of, especially when people decide to start off on their own business. Now, we're not talking about um, startup guys that are usually maybe a little bit more steeped in technology or have gone through business school or whatever, but we're talking of somebody that has built up a skill set maybe as an apprentice and then now decide, okay, now is the time for me to, you know, launch my own shop. Then they're, they're not They're not really skilled or trained in thinking logically through the top-down method like like you suggest you know so that i think that's where a lot of business owners especially small business owners get into trouble because they don't sit down with maybe someone that knows these steps or is thinking through these processes they just say hey i'm going to hang my shingle out i'm going to get clients and then i'm going to start making money has that been good, your experience good. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, in fact, I can give your your listeners here a little a little um, a model to follow, if if that's okay. Um, first, you start out with uh, revenue. So uh, this is just an accounting lesson. It's real simple. Uh, you start with your revenue, and then um, number two is minus your cost of sales. Now, cost of sales is your variable costs, um, one time charges that would be commission or the part or whatever they're dealing with. And then that leaves you with your gross profit um, or company dollars, I like to refer to it. And out of that company dollar is what you get to pay your expenses with. And then that's going to leave you a, a number. Uh, and then that number, you you multiply your um, income tax into that and then take that away from that. And then you end up with your net net, as they call it. Yeah. Okay, so net 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 is what you know um, is what we're going for mm -hmm. is that how much we keep you know it's not how much you make it's how much you keep mm -hmm. so now the cost the variable cost is very important and just give you a quick example with that uh, I was helping later on an air conditioning company um, uh, right there locally and so I went into work with you know to the guy and I said well okay let's look at your your price because I, I contribute to the bottom line I'm not a, a typical your typical coach or consultant I'm actually a business into business film where I get paid based on um, knowing that I can uh, contribute to you making money so anyway I looked at his thing I said what are you selling your 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 um, installation for he said 2500 and I said, well, how did you come up with that number? And he says, well, the industry dictates that you mark your prices up 40%. And I said, yeah, that's true. And I said, but how did you get to that? And he says, well, 1800 uh, plus 40% is about $2,500. And I said, yeah, but that's not 40% markup. That's a 40% add-on. Yeah. See, there's a difference between add-on and markup. Yeah. I said, so what you should be selling this job for is 3000 because 40% uh, percent of 3000 is 1200 You take 1200 away from the 3000 that gets you to your 800 That's a $500 swing in money and it took him from not making a profit to start being profitable. Mm. One little misunderstanding about 40% markup versus 40% yeah. gross margin. Yeah. That's amazing. So I guess that leads me to my next question, which is um, what were some of the biggest challenges you experienced as an entrepreneur? And what are some of the biggest challenges that you've had that your clients have had while you've been working with them? Good question. Um, largely, uh, the, the problem with me was uh, was finding um, my sweet spot is I think the technology is today. Uh, so, like in air conditioning, uh, it was uh, service. Everybody that gets into the air conditioning business goes for installations. Well, there's no real money in that, but where the real money was was in service. And I could make more money in there. And there was a lot of room for improvement there. One of the things that I got taught early in business was pick an industry that's, that's – uh, having problems and then get right in the middle of it and if you can find ways to add value uh, to that concept you'll make some good money oh. uh, so I added like a year guarantee everybody else was talking about um, you know 90 day guarantees well I um, said okay well let's make it a year guarantee 
that ensured me a, a second opportunity, a second bite of the apple, um, by doing, uh, by being able to go out and be the first one called. And you get there and you find out it's a different part. Then you got a, that. You got an opportunity to make another sale. Yeah. Or, and one of the things I put in my uh, routine was if you said, well, Terry, I just put $200 in this thing a couple months ago. And now you're asking me to put another couple. You know, with another couple, I could have a brand new machine. And I said, so that's true. So you pick out the machine you want, the price that you want to pay for it. And I, uh, you can pay for it. And I'll match that price less the 200 that you just spent on it. Well, yeah, I lost money, but how many people do you think that, that you would have gone around and told that if somebody made you aware of their air conditioning being broken? Mm, well, that calls, call, calls started flooding in. Huh. And you, my, my rule is you find a customer, you keep them, and then you get them to spend more money. And that doesn't mean that you upsell them or you tear their head off. It means that you find ways to continue to sell to them. We use it in marketing, you know, you use it yourself, you know, upsells, downsells, that type of thing. Uh -huh. And you increase the lifetime value of the customer just by adding that guarantee because you've reversed the risk. They know that they can sleep better at night knowing that whatever happens in the next one year, Terry comes in to take care of it. And then um, it just may happen that whatever is wrong or broken may not be part of the uh, of the service or warranty agreement and then you can make the sale there or even you can also while you're there cross sell into something else where you can get another revenue stream plus it's also gives you a, a opportunity for service recovery now it's, what it's what, do you, what do you mean by service recovery um we in business we make far more money if we can solve the person's problem I worked for Radio Shack, as you noted on my one sheet, um, and in that case, that's retail. And a lot of times, customers would come in, and you know, they would buy something, they'd get it home, and then it just didn't quite work right or whatever. And I'd be sitting in my in the office, and you could see the black bags coming towards the front door type thing. And I would get up and start to move towards the counter because I knew the associates were coming to the back room because they didn't want to deal with that. Why well, go in and make the customer happy? Just a really little quick story here about that. There was a um, little guy about five years old, and his mom came in, and they had one of those little electronic toys, you know, one of those um, little speed car things, you know, battery-operated stuff. Mm -hmm. And so she brought it in and said, it quit working, so remote control cars. And so I checked everything out, and the thing should work, you know, and the batteries were good and all that stuff, put fresh batteries in, didn't work. And I said, no, buddy, you're talking to the little guy, you know, and I said, no, buddy, I'm sorry, it doesn't work. And he goes, well, it worked really good until it went in the pool. <laughs> and I looked up at the mom, and I said, really? And she goes, no, it didn't. And he goes, yes, it did, mom. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, son. I think I have one of these just exactly like this in the back room. Let me go check and let me see. So I went back and, of course, I had one. Um, and I brought it back and I said, and this is this is for you. I'm, I put it in, made it sure it worked and everything. I said, this is for you for being so honest with me today. Wow. And he left. Now, that cost the store eight bucks. Okay. Did I save a customer? You bet. Yeah. Right. So it's the service recovery that oftentimes makes uh, the, the customer stay with you. It's when you, you, you're mean to them or you, you treat them poorly, what happens is they, they go, they're not in that, but they're going to go out and tell like 25 people of their experience. Yes. Now that lady probably would never tell anybody her experience. But at the same time, um, you did the right thing for the right reason. What are some of the main challenges you help your clients overcome in their businesses? Most of the time when I get involved in a client, uh, the first thing we go to work on is I want to see their organizational chart. And so uh, because it starts with infrastructure. If you don't have a good uh, foundation, uh, your business is going to be scattered. And people will say to me, even your audience is going to say to me, well, Terry, we're too small. Yes. No, you're not. You're not too small to have an organizational chart. Because let me ask you this, G. Um, do you have, um, in, we're just talking general business. Um, is there accounts payable? Yes, there is. Is there accounts receivable? Yes. Is there bookkeeping? 
Yes. Um, sales. Yes. Marketing coordinating. Yep. Um, office managing. Yes, there is. Customer service. Yes. Administrative assistant. Yeah, okay. There. Well, guess who those are? Those are all you. Yeah. So my suggestion would be for your audience to go out and which I do this for my clients is we first formulate the organizational chart, you know, who's how, who reports to who and all the, the, the described the positions go out on the internet, type in job description for customer service. You'll get a whole list of the responsibilities, pick the ones that belong to you individually, because those are the things that you're doing. Accounts payable, same thing. What are those line items in that one that you're doing? You won't have to do all 40 of them, but you may be doing three or four of them. Okay. This provides you with that, that stability, and, that, and then you can time block that time and say, okay, I'm going to spend this much time in accounting. I'm going to spend this much time in, in sales. I'm going to spend this time in marketing, and you divide up your time into those little hats. I just had a, I got off a call earlier this morning, um, and – the, uh, the, the, we put uh, the organizational charts in place and the job descriptions were in place. And what happened was, in this particular case, the people went on vacation and they didn't assign these responsibilities that these people were doing. And when they come back, the, the company's in chaos. Yeah. So let's get organized first. You know, there's, you know, just like when we get on a, on a job, the first thing you want to do is you want to make sure you have all the tools. If you pull anything off the, you know, come home from Target with something, the first thing you want to do is pull out the instruction manual, read it, make sure you have all the tools, put it together. Well, that's, let's get organized first. So that's the answer to your question is, first thing I want to do is get my clients organized. Oh. Get them organized. Now we can start moving in an organized fashion. We can only go as fast as the slowest vehicle in any in a caravan. We can only go as fast as the slowest person. Anything else after that? Um, I got a little four-step thing for your audience and yourself. And so if you just pull out a piece of paper and, a, and something to write with, and I'm going to give you four things. Four little steps right here sure. that will help any business. Okay. Lay Ready? On me. Lay it on me. Okay. The first thing is you have to make a decision. Okay. Mm -hmm. You have to you have to make the decision on what it is you're going to do. So if you're wobbling on the fence, you're not sure about this, that, just make the decision. Okay. And then back that with a why. Why does that why does that desire have to be? Why does that decision need to be? Uh, take place. You back it with a purpose, a why, then you can start to create the passion. Um, Number two. Wait, so let, is, me, let me reiterate that again. So it says okay. you make a decision, you back it with a strong why, and then that creates the passion. Now, usually, I think I've heard in some of the guru circles that, you know, you have to do what you're passionate about, do what you're passionate about, and that's how the money will come. You're saying here that there's basically a process to creating the passion for anything you want to achieve, that the passion doesn't just happen on its own. I mean, people are passionate about a lot of things, but those things they're passionate about don't necessarily lead to um, creating wealth. Exactly. Okay. Like me, I got involved in podcasting. Okay. Now I started. I started to build my brand eleven years after my business was started. Mm. Now locally, you know, people know me in circles and mastermind groups and different things. That's okay. Now I'm wanting to get my myself out there through podcasting mm -hmm. and branding myself as a business development guru. Yeah. Okay. But now that I made the decision to do do that, pull the trigger on that. Now I got a why. I know why I'm doing it. Now I will also be able to tell you, Chi, that I have launched my own podcast, mm. not for me, but for I'm a Shriner. I belong to the Shriner organization. Okay. So we want to get our message out. So I created a podcast um, that goes out to our um, to our nobles, so they can keep up to date with what's going on in our in our world. Okay. But that started by making me making a decision, and I didn't have. Podcast. Yeah. I created the why I wanted me on. Now I'm passionate about it. I think I told you a story earlier before we got on the uh, got on the program that I would try to do one uh, podcast from a from a hotspot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you 
right? And you shared with me some of your stories about how your this podcast is is is, is your you know pack. But yes, once you develop the 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 decision, then you put the why. Why is that important to you? And then the passion will grow. Yeah. Okay? Then I, you know one of the things I do, I've gone into many companies and said, well, I want to help people. That's my passion. I want to help people. Well, you're broke. How can you help anybody? Yeah. Let's make money, and then we can help. Yeah. Okay, so, so we get that confused. And um, the second thing we want to do is we have to be disciplined. Okay. So that means that, um, that we have to put disciplines in our life to make sure that we are staying focused on the decision that we've made. Okay. So you can't be spending half the time at the beach if you're trying to create a company. Yeah. You can't be on the golf course and try to create a business. You got to be. You got to make put disciplines in your life to stay focused. And uh, when I work with clients, I want them to be able to put no more than sixty hours a week in their business, and no less than forty-eight hours. That's that's the mark of of. And then go home and go be with the family, go do things. But you have to have disciplines. Disciplines, and you create disciplines in your life through learning to manage your time. Forget this time management stuff. If there was a book on time management, I'd be glad to share it with you. But you only have 168 hours in your life, so be disciplined about all 168 hours of those a week. Oh, that makes perfect sense. Now, number three is once you got those two things in place, now it's time to be decisive. Now, decisive in, in this context means make sure you're using your time wisely. Or is what you're doing right now taking you towards that decision that you made? You know, I give all my clients permission to procrastinate on anything that isn't taking them towards their goal. Okay. We establish a primary aim, and we do this on a quarterly basis, not yearly, because stretching out a year, you know, that's a myth. Okay, used to it could work, but technology changes so fast and so uh, quickly these days mm. that we can stay focused for 90 days. At yeah. the end of 90 days, stop, evaluate, redirect your course, get back on course. What took you off course? Get Figure all those things out. Get yourself all put together. I'm getting ready to fly up to Chicago in October because we're going to do a quarterly meeting, and we're going to get right back on, on focus for the things that we need. But make sure that you're, you're – Decisive about your the time and where you're putting that energy and making sure it's moving you towards your goals. And again, it doesn't have to be business. It can be family goals. It can be friend goals. It can be you know, giving goals. It doesn't matter. Just make sure that you're decisive about your your the managing of your time. And then the last thing on the list is you have to visualize it. We are people who think in pictures. We resonate with pictures. The more, you know, you've heard vision boards, you've heard mm -hmm. The Secret, you've all this stuff. All of it's great, uh, and I and agree with it wholeheartedly, except for the fact that you have to do some work. You just can't imagine things, and they're going to appear before you. But I'm a big proponent of, of, of vision boards. So visualize how this decision is going to – what that decision uh, – what is that decision that you made? What is that going to look like when it's completely finished? And if you start thinking in pictures, what happens is you, everything that we look around you, everything that was done, designed was first created on a piece of paper before it ever, ever came to light. Yeah. So architects, they, they build a building on paper. Well, build your business on paper. Then, then, put the, then start putting things together. Get organized. Get yourself uh, all put together on paper, and then you have to – Get up in every morning and remind yourself of this vision. I put uh, my – I have a, a – uh, in my terminology, I use the word magic key. And I get all my clients to develop a magic key that is, that is specifically for them. And their, their responsibility is to read this magic key um, every night before they go to bed. Think about it for 10 minutes, visualizing, go into their theater of their imagination and visualize it all coming out the way they want it to. Go to sleep, let the subconscious work on it, and then get up in the morning, revitalize your uh, – by reading and going into your um, imagination again, and then go off and do your work. You don't have to worry about it. 
it'll all start to come towards you. Yeah, and it's and it's funny that you're laying this out like this because I'm currently listening to the book called um, New Psycho Cybernetics. I've had a lot of people recommend it to me, and I've just started listening to it by uh, Audible. And some of the first few things he talked about were things like visualization, you know, um, restating out your goals, trying to get disciplined and laying out your plan for the future and what you want to do so it, it's it's funny how these timeless principles are the foundations of success but yet people seem to think there's there's some magic bullet out there that you're just going to shoot off and then overnight like a magic genie everything is going to happen these are basically timeless principles that have worked for countless of people that once you just start to implement and follow them they will work for you too there's no secret. And that's one of the, I'm sorry. I think that's the secret. There is no secret. <laughs> um, the, in the, the secret, I'll, even, I'll give you the secret coming from Think and Grow Rich because the secret was given to Napoleon Hill by uh, Andrew Carnegie. He gave it to him. And then he sent him out on his mission. And I also recommend that book as a, as a good starting book too. Yeah. Um, but the secret is your subconscious. Wow. And, and that relates to Maxwell Maltz, which is, uh, like you, you point out, the psycho cybernetics that was written by Maxwell Maltz, Maltz in 1960. And he discovered in our, in our subconscious we have something called a servo mechanism. Now, this servo mechanism is a little piece in our brain now that scientists have, have actually identified. Remember, we didn't have MRAs back then. But now we have a scientific uh, the name for it is called your reticular activating system yeah. or RAS for short. Well, this is our servo mechanism by his, his, um, you know, his words. And when we set our mission, our goal on, on, on a target, we're going to get constant feedback and the feedback corrects our course. Uh -huh. Well, there was a, a time uh, in 2009 where one of our, um, submarines shot a missile, uh, it was submerged in the Pacific Ocean, and it was the idea was to test to see if it could shoot a um, satellite falling from the sky. And so the sub launched its missile, aimed for that um, for that falling satellite. Chi, do you know how what percentage of time that missile was on target for its for its destination? On target. On target. Uh, I don't know, maybe ten percent of the time. 8% of the time. Wow. Think about it. As the earth turns and the, and the winds and the – you just uh, – I know you fly. We talked about that. Well, how many times does a plane change course? Yeah, many, You're going along times. and all of a sudden the, it, you have reached turbulence. Well, the pilot now is all trying to keep on course. Yeah. The curvature of the earth and, and all these things and the moving of the satellite and it slowing down and speeding up, whatever. It was only – so, you know, for your listeners – that's why I say stop every 90 days and do a checkpoint to see if this is where your vision was. At the end of 90 days, if you're off course, you get a chance to, um, to pull yourself back on course. Uh -huh. But if you don't take this time to evaluate what you did right, what you did wrong, and what could you have done better, that's the key. Then you can get yourself back on course. If most of the businesses uh, out there, they make a year plan – and then what happens is they put 30 to 40 percent of their um, their effort in in the last quarter. When we were at Radio Shack, what we did was we put everybody on a daily plan to hit goal. This was unique for us because what we would do is we say, "Okay, you did. Um, today is a Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday. Last year at this time you did X number of dollars. We want you to to make 10 percent more that day." And then we'd have the each manager figure out what their daily goals were for each day. And then they had to draw a red arrow when it was down, and they make a down arrow in red. And if it was up, they put a green arrow in uh, on the day if it was if it was they made their goal. And any manager could walk in there and tell in a, a matter of um, seconds where the where that store was oh. by the number of green and red uh, arrows. Nice. Now that tells us that we got a bunch of red arrows that we need to work on our sales team. Nice, nice. 
And uh, as we start to transition towards the uh, end of the show, I have some questions for you. But oh, so where were we? You had some questions. I think you said you you had a couple of questions you wanted to ask me. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, we talked a lot about you know working on the business and not in the business. So I think um, before we segue towards like some of the wrapping up questions, I think the main question I have for you now is. Most new business owners, when they start their business, the biggest problem they have that I've come across is getting customers. So how would you coach someone listening to this podcast to start thinking about um, customer acquisition? Uh, good good question. And, it's, and you're spot on too because um, a lot of people you know, think just because they hang their shingle out that people are going to flock to them. Yeah. Um, Marketing is a is a you know tricky thing as you know, um, so there's a first of all you want to do, depending on if you're going to be you know internet or you know to, each marketing thing uh, each uh, business is different in their marketing. Um, if you're in retail, one of the things you'd want to do is circle around your location, and you would want to make sure that 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 location. Uh, there's enough customers in that five mile radius that will continue to buy from you and, and be a part of your world. Okay. And that's, and then you can do some direct marketing. I'm not a big fan of mass marketing, direct marketing. Nowadays you can zero down in not only to zip codes, but you can des- design your direct marketing piece to all uh, people who own Mercedes, Lexus, whatever. Yeah. Um, you can, you can zero marketing. When I was in air conditioning, you could do it by zip codes, but, um, but in another time, another day, um, if you're doing it from a, um, more of a service aspect, meaning they're, they're going to call me, you know, when there's something breaks, um, then you have to do something like put guarantees in there. Uh, you know, like what I did with air conditioning was I picked the areas where the um, air conditionings were most likely to break, and then I focused my attention on those areas. Um, another other ways is to not only take into consideration your demographic, so each one of your people out there can take and divide their da- customer database into a, a pie circle, and wherever there is uh, the largest number of uh, people in that sliver of pie, say it's 28%, define that target market. And then you go into what is their demographic. And you may want to take two slices of pie because you need to get at least two slices of, uh, or at least uh, up to 40 to 45 percent of your business is your mainstay. And then you, like in travel, we went after 20 to 100 thousand dollar accounts, business accounts, corporate travel, because nobody was servicing them. And then you focus on that. You get your demographic put together. What is the ideal person? What do they look like? Family, two kids, whatever that might be. But there's one element we want to add into this, and that's called psychographics. Okay. And this is where they hang out. So it's not just about knowing that you want to target 25 to 45 year old people, but you also want to target, you know, where they where they hang out, the beach, the nightclubs, whatever that might be. But that's very important to understand your customer. The other thing that we want to uh, uh, understand in marketing is product knowledge is not the key anymore. Consumer knowledge is the key. Mm -hmm. And the reason consumer knowledge is the key is because 86% of the people start their buying process online. So they don't need salespeople. Yeah. So... We want to we want to understand how the customer buying behaviors are, and then adapt our our sale, our marketing and sales to their knowledge, the way they buy things. Okay. And then the most important thing is always, always, always build trust with and rapport with your with your customers. Live a life of integrity, even if you're going to lose money. I have a guarantee with my, my – I'm the only sales, uh, only consultant, um, coach, business development guru, whatever you want to call me. But I'm the only one that gives a guarantee with their work, 100% money back if they put my processes in place and they don't work. Hmm. Interesting. And I've had many of colleagues tell me, Terry, you're going to go broke. I say, yeah, don't do it my way. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. 
Um, so that's the, the in, in marketing is very tricky in these days, you know, as you know. Um, so, and I, you know, there's, um, there's some good marketing tips out there and I'm sure you can provide those for you. For you. I'm more into direct marketing rather than mass marketing. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And based based on what I hear you say, I'm hearing a little bit of uh, some of Dan Kennedy's philosophy. I think uh, I, I, I know I know of him. I've never dealt with read of any of his stuff. My stuff comes from uh, Brian Tracy. Okay. Brian Tracy yeah, is probably. I, yeah, I think they're all in the same group. Yeah, they're all the same. They drink out of the same bottle, as my dad would say. Okay, <laughs> uh, like you said earlier, there's no magic bullets. Yeah. These guys just swap stories. Yeah. Um, but I've been listening. I've been selling probably longer than most of your listeners have been on this earth. I started selling in 1973. Yeah. Wow. So, and Brian Tracy has been all about building relationships ever since that I can remember. And it was called relationship selling. Now, now there's a whole new model of selling. You go online, you can type in new model of selling and you, your, your audience can, can learn what the new model is and, and learn how to be a sales consultant rather than a salesperson. Yeah. Nice. Nice. All right. So, so like last three wrap it up questions are, um, what gets you excited in the morning to get up? And meditation. Go to work? Meditation and my purpose. Everybody should have a purpose. My purpose is bridge the gaps between dreams and, and reality. Um, all my clients have a dream. I need to find out what that dream is. And then I have to connect it with the reality that they're living in. And they always, every business per, uh, owner, every person that's on your podcast, there's a glass ceiling. They can see what they want, but they have, they always get to that glass ceiling, keeps knocking them down. Mm. Well, you got to learn how to build the bridge from the dream back to the reality. So you build bridges from both ends. And they don't not they're not building their bridge from the dream backwards. Think about it. I don't know if most of your listeners have ever seen a bridge uh, being built, but they don't build bridge build a bridge from one side to the other. They build from both sides to the middle. Mm. And what's the biggest takeaway lesson you've gained from a challenging moment in your business? Um, this is a, probably one of the most challenging things that have happened is going back to the air conditioning world. Um, it was, we were about six people strong. Um, we here in Florida and, you know, sometimes in the winter, we don't have a, like a winter. So it's a, a slow season. And, uh, gee, it came down to, I had enough money to pay payroll and I had enough money to pay the phone bill. It was one or the other. Mm. And so I called everybody in. It was Thursday evening. I called everybody in and I, I, put my cards out transparent, put my cards out on the table. I said, look, guys, we got enough money to pay the phone bill. We got enough money to make payroll. It's your money. You tell me what to do. And that point right there, it's their money, isn't it? They worked all week for it. And they mm -hmm. don't, you don't want to be standing there on Friday saying, look, I had to pay the phone bill. Now, a lot of business owners would have done that. Mm -hmm. I felt like that my integrity was strong, that, that my integrity is stronger than anything. So if I put my cards on the table and one of the guys said, does that mean we can't get any money? And I said, no, this is how much money we have. We just have to divide it up. And so everybody walked away with a little, the phone bill got paid. And I said, I had, you know, I've got money coming in next week. It's not a big thing. It just didn't arrive this week and it's expected next week and everything would be back to normal. But if I hadn't have done that, I wouldn't have gone on to spend 10 years in the business and sell my business to my employees. That's who I sold my business to. You want to be able to, to build a business that you don't have to be a part of it. You want to be able to sell it. And you know, that my idea was one of the things I teach my uh, people that come on board with me is let's create a business that you you can sell and walk away with in 18 to 24 months. Wow. That's a really short it, period of time. Well, I took a company public in two and a half years. Wow. From, from a kitchen table, five people sitting around a kitchen table in a two-bedroom, two-bath apartment. Uh, it can be done if you, if you get the right people and put the right people in place. You, get, you, you can't be afraid to go out and hire the – if you need um, – like Radio Shack did. Radio Shack went out and hired Lynn Roberts as their CEO. 
Well, Lynn Roberts was the CEO of Shoney's and the board says, well, what does a hamburger flipper know about selling electronics? You hire the right you hire the right people, put them in the right position, and and who Tony Robbins he doesn't he's not the CEO of his company no he's the chairman of the board of his company, <laughs> <laughs> but but he creates the vision he passes it on to the CEO and he expects that that guy to run it. Do what he speaks. That's what he's great at. Getting yeah. the crowd alive and out there. I'm a firewalker. I've walked on hot burning coals with no shoes on. Really. Barefoot. Yes, sir. Wow. And, and in fact, that's what caused, that's the legitimate cause for me to go into my business in 2005. I did that in 2004. And once you've done something like that, gee, you, there's no, nothing can stop you. Mm. And I'm not sending everybody out to go walk on fire or glass or all that other <laughs> stuff. I'm just saying that sometimes you just need that little push. Yeah. And I guess the last question for today would be um, a lot of listeners on the show are either young entrepreneurs or people transitioning off of a corporate job thinking to start their own business or their own venture. So what would you advise people in this transitionary or early phase of their career thinking about entrepreneurship? First of all, knowledge is, is everything. Get all the be a uh, con, you know follow Tony's principle constant and never ending improvement. Get all the knowledge you can about the industry. Everything that you're going to be, do about it. Uh, you like for an example, um, Disney World. Everybody knows about Walt Disney and whatever. Um, but what most people don't realize is that Disney does not see another theme park as their competition. They see Nordstrom's as their competition. Now, Nordstrom's is a department store. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Um, yes. Most people are. Yeah. Okay. Um, and in Nordstrom's, every Nordstrom store in the back room has a car tire that hangs in that room. Do you know why? No. To, to remind every sales associate of the little old man who who brought back his tires to Nordstrom and got a full refund. You know what's unique about that? They don't sell tires. Exactly. But no customer walks out of Nordstrom's without being satisfied. Wow. Period. That's just their, that's just what they stand by. So Disney said, well, I, we need to adopt that policy. So don't study necessarily your competition. Don't even think about your competition. Put your sights on somebody that you want to, you know, be like Disney did with Nordstrom's. The, to Disney, it's the guest experience that they care more about than anything. Mm -hmm. And most people are just one of the things that they do. Um, Main Street. Anybody's been on on Disney World or Disneyland or whatever. There's a Main Street, and you walk through it, and there's these little hitching posts, horse, horse head hitching posts, out in front of every one of those little stores. They strip and paint those, those, um, I lost my train of thought there for a second. Um, uh, they strip and paint those every night after the guests go home and have them ready the next morning. So the guest never sees those um, things as unpainted or chipped or marked in any way. Mm, wow. That is amazing. And with that said, we've come to the end of the show. So, Terry, before we go, tell us a little bit about where people can connect with you and learn more about you and your business. Good. Thank you. Um, first of all, they can connect with me on Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, um, easy to find, Terry Ogburn, uh, O-G-B-U-R-N. Uh, also, terryogburn.com. Uh, Ogburn's Business Solutions. Those are my two websites. There are a lot of S's in Ogburn's Business Solutions, so remember to put them all in there, .com. Um, and also, I have an offer for your uh, listeners. I, I'm willing to give any one of your listeners uh, a half hour of my time, a uh, coaching session, you come, your challenge you're having, it'd be like a mastermind thing. Uh, you uh, just go into my, one of my websites, either one, Go up to the Contact Us button, uh, click on that. It'll drop down to come. You just put in your name and your uh, email address and a problem that you may be having, challenge you may be having, and that'll come to me. 
Uh, we'll con get in contact with each other. We'll set up a half hour session. I promise them no sales pitch. It's not about that. It's, I just want to help them through uh, one of the challenges that they may be having uh, in their world. Nice, nice. And I, and I hope everyone listening will take advantage of that offer because I'm going to go get on a call with Terry myself and uh, <laughs> you <laughs> as a business owner you take every help you can get you know from wherever it comes so thank you for that gracious offer Terry to the listeners out there I'm going to take advantage of it and uh, I hope you don't get flooded with too many people <laughs> well I hope so I mean I just want to help uh, you know I've you know that's the, the thing about being able when you when you get it and you know give it back and the you know, my one of my meditation, part of my meditation is um, if you help up enough people get what you want, you will surely get what you need. Yeah. Yeah. And with that said, Terry, it's been a pleasure hanging out with you for the last one hour. Just <laughs> talking about business and life. I, I, I really wish we could go on for much longer, but I know you're very busy and uh, I'll have to get back to you some other time. But uh, thanks for coming on the show to share your words of wisdom and your business advice with me and the listeners. Well, th uh, thank you too so much, uh, Chi. Um, I've enjoyed this show, and like you said, it went an hour, so it went a little over an hour. But anyway, yeah. it's just been it's been great fun. It's joy when you can spend an hour someplace and you don't even realize it's gone by. It's pretty cool. Yeah, cool, cool, and that's it. We're we're done. Awesome. Again, thank you so much. It's, it really was. I got thrill bumps when you were when you were saying that last piece there. So I just wanted to share that with you, too. Oh, oh, thanks a lot. Terry. I appreciate that. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning into the show today. If you love what you hear on today's episode of the podcast, go to iTunes and leave a review and a comment. It helps other great listeners like yourself find the show. And of course, you can always find more episodes of the Bulletproof Entrepreneur Podcast at www.odogwu.com.